visions by your love. Sing it with us. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, then know we are Christians by our love. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Does that help? Yeah. All right. It is nice to look out and see so many people for this sacred night. If you are signed up to remove an item for the stripping of the sanctuary, you just take it and you walk straight back there through those doors and set it somewhere where there isn't something else. It's not a very formal process. The idea is just to create the sovereignness and solemnity of a world without Christ, which is what we had for parts of three days. Throughout the service, standing is optional. There's no right, no wrong way to sing to the Lord as long as we sing with our hearts. Please join me in the Monday Thursday litany. On this day, Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. On this day, for the salvation of all who trust in him, Jesus, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. Please join me for the gathering prayer. Merciful Father, as we gather at your house of prayer, we turn our hearts to your life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us to see the ugliness of sin and the price paid to set us free from the penalty of sin and the power it holds over us. Give us faith to trust in Jesus as Savior and to obey him as Lord. Help us live now the new life you make possible as we abide in him. Help us to perceive more of your unfathomable love for us and empower us to love all people and the kind of love we see in Jesus. Amen. I 
him eyes for all who long to see in the shadows of the night I will confession and our assurance of pardon come from Paul's letter to the Romans. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and repentance, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Please pray with me. Loving, holy, triune God, I thank you so much for your amazing, self-giving love. When I consider the incarnation, the cross, your great faithfulness, and the precious promises you have made to me, Lord, I am astounded. You call us to treat all people with the same kind of self-giving love with which you treat us. I confess that I frequently fail to love as you love. Sometimes I am selfish when I should be self-giving. Even though my Savior washed feet, I sometimes feel that certain tasks are beneath me. Even though you forgive me, I sometimes hold grudges. Father, by the blood of Jesus, please wash away my sin. By the Holy Spirit, please tenderly transform me increasingly into the image and likeness of Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen. This is the kernel of the gospel. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. In Jesus, we are forgiven. 
Thanks be to God. He 
yes, Father, yes, most willingly, I'll bear what you command me. My will conforms to your decree, I'll do what you have asked me. Oh, wondrous love, what have you done? The Father offers up his Son, desiring our salvation. Oh, love, how strong you are to save. You make his bed with ease. foundation from morn till even all I do I praise you Christ my treasure to sacrifice myself for you shall be my aim and pleasure my stream of life shall ever be a current flowing ceaselessly. Your constant praise outpouring, I'll treasure in my memory. Oh Lord, all you have done for me, your gracious love. Adoring of death, I am no more afraid. New life from you is flowing. Your cross affords me cooling shade when noonday sun is glowing. When by my grief. I am oppressed on you, my weary soul will rest serenely as on pillows. You are my anchor when my woe, my bark is driven to and fro upon life's searching. And when your glory I shall see And taste your kingdom's pleasure Your blood my royal robe shall be My joy beyond all measure When I appear before your throne Your righteousness shall be I need not hide me, and there in garments richly wrought, as your own I shall be brought to stand in joy beside thee. Please join me for the prayer for illumination. Eternal God, you have given us a new commandment to love and serve one another in Jesus' name. Let the good news of your liberating love be sealed in our hearts and in, excellent, are in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Tonight, being Monday, Thursday, and since it's fairly common that I run into people who are like, what's Monday, Thursday? 
I said, no, it's not Monday, Thursday. It's Monday, Thursday. You know, from the Latin word from which we get our English word mandate. So Monday, Thursday is a night in which we celebrate the new commandment that Jesus gave us. And at the same meal, he also gave us communion. Hear now the word of the Lord from John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter replied, Then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is who I am. Now that I, your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And moving up to verse 34, we receive the new command. A new command I give you, love one another. In the same way that I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you really are my disciples, by your love for one another. God's word for us, God's children. Foot washing. Yuck. Fun fact, if a Jewish master wanted to have a slave to wash his feet, that Jewish master had to go get a Gentile slave because according to rabbinic law, no Jewish master could force a Jewish slave to wash feet. That's how lowly a task it was. It was one of the lowest, lowliest, least desirable tasks in the ancient world. Because back then, feet were far more filthy than our feet are today. A tiny fraction of Christians across the centuries have believed that Jesus actually commands us to wash feet. 
you might believe that. And if you believe that, you might be right. But I don't think so. The vast majority of Christians throughout the centuries have always believed that the washing of feet is an example of what Jesus actually commands, which is humble, self-giving, servant-style love. The love that Jesus has for us is the model for the love that he commands us to have for one another. If our Savior washed dirty feet, is there any task that's really beneath us, especially when we do it as an act of humble love? The love Jesus has for us and the love that he commands us to have for one another includes affection. But it does not stop there because the love that Jesus has for us and that he commands us to have for one another includes action. The love Jesus has for us and commands from us includes actions of humble, self-giving service, putting the good of others before our own good. Now, here's something that's very obvious but it bears repeating because, well, even though we may know it in our heads, the way we live, and I'm saying we, I'm not saying the way you live, the way we live shows that, well, we may know this, we forget it in our behavior, which is where it really matters. Jesus did not command us to do active self-giving love when it's convenient. Jesus did not command us to do active self-giving love when we feel like it. Jesus did not command us to do active self-giving love for people who we think deserve it. Jesus does command us to do active self-giving love when we don't feel like it and for people who we don't think deserve it. Doing active self-giving love when we don't feel like it, and for people who don't deserve it, is part of what makes it new. Part of its newness is that the new love that Jesus commands is based on the love that Jesus gives. And you and I do not deserve his love. Jesus loves us in spite of the fact we don't deserve it. And Jesus commands us to love other people, even when we feel they don't deserve it. If we just get that much right and live it out, the world would be a better place. Churches would be full because people would see the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. If we just could get that part right, doing active self-giving love when we don't feel like it and for people who we don't think deserve it. The new love command given by Jesus is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate, and yet it's profound enough for mature believers to trip over and to recognize how we fail to consistently live it out. Jesus says, love one another, kathos, just as, in the same way as, I have loved you. His love is the model, his foot washing love, his patient love. His forbearing love, his I'll die in your place love. That's the love that he calls for from us. The standard of love Jesus commands is the love that he exemplified by washing feet. In addition to being an example of the humble serving love that Jesus commands, 
the foot washing also points beyond itself. The foot washing foreshadows the cross. We see that in the little conversation between Jesus and Simon Peter. Jesus doesn't exactly tell Peter this, but when we read the text and think about it, especially in context, it becomes obvious that the foot washing foreshadows the cross in that the washing of the feet points to the washing from sin, which he would soon be doing. The more we appreciate his love for us and what it means for us to love like he loves, the more we realize how far, how far short we fall. When we understand more of what it means to love like Jesus, we recognize how frequently we fail to live up to that command. And recognizing the magnitude of our failure makes us appreciate his forgiveness and grace even more. I've already said that part of the newness of the new command is that it's based on the love that Jesus gives. But here's another thing about the newness of the command. That word, kathos, which means as, just as, in the same way as, also has a causative thrust to it. What it means is that the love that Jesus commands is a love that Jesus empowers. The love that Jesus commands is a love that Jesus empowers. He helps us do what he tells us to do. And that's good because we need the help. I want to share four things that we all can do. Four things I try to do and I sometimes fail. In fact, some days I fail a lot. But these are four things that we can each strive to do and they will make us more like Jesus in love. Number one, for those of you who want, to, who want these four things, I'd be happy to give them to you. You don't have to scribble them down. Number one, we need to throw away our rationalizations, our excuses, and our exclusions. He didn't really mean that. Oh, but uh, not you. We need to throw away our rationalizations, our excuses, and our exclusions. We need to accept that Jesus really does command each of us personally to do active self-giving love, whether we feel like it or not. Number two, because Jesus is the source of the love he commands, we can and should ask him to help us to love as he loves. We can and should ask Jesus to help us to have the affection and to do the actions that constitute the love he commands. Number three, we need to do our best to actively strive to love the people around us. Sometimes that's really hard, isn't it? The closer the quarters, sometimes the harder it is to love. But we need to actually try and pray to try harder and do it better. And number four, when we find it difficult to love, we pause. We ask Jesus to help us, and then we go back to actively striving to love with active, humble, self-giving love. 
learning to feel and to do Christ-like love, it's a lot like going to the gym. How many of us have made a resolution to go to the gym and get big, buff, and ripped and yet not follow through on it? Well, it's like going to the gym in that we have to do more than decide to do it. We have to actually get up and do it. It takes effort, and it's not something we do all at once. You can't go in and, you know, do a single workout and come out looking like a gorilla. It takes time, repetition, habit. And sometimes it's unpleasant. But just like going to the gym, when we are we make persistent efforts, we get pleasing results. When we put in the work, when we put in the repetitions, we get the growth. If we keep working at it day after day, in a gym, our bodies get stronger. And if we keep working at it day after day, our capacity for Christ-like love will increase. Please pray with me. Lord, your love for us is more than we can fully fathom. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that he prayed that they would come to understand and experience more of the height, breadth, and depth of your love for them. And we ask that same thing for ourselves. Help us to better understand, better perceive and enjoy your love. And let your love for us run through us to others. We ask this in the name of Jesus, praying together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In addition to giving us that love command at that dinner, the night before going to the cross, Jesus also gave us this sacred meal, a sacred meal which helps us to remember, a sacred meal which feeds and nourishes us in ways that we don't fully understand. I want to be very clear that this is not a members-only table. This is not just an adult table. This table and what's on it is for all people who trust in Jesus and desire his help to live a more godly life. So regardless of how old or young you are, regardless of any church membership you may or may not have, if you trust Jesus, if you love Jesus, or if you even want to, he, not me, invites you to this table. Please join me in the prayer of consecration. Gracious God, pour out the Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. And through them, do in us whatever you desire to do. Work in us so that we may be, for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By the Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, 
one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet with your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, our Savior took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, my blood which is poured out, poured out for many, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Sandy will be handing out the bread and the juice, which have been individually packaged, and Dick will be sanitizing everybody as they come forward. Come, receive the gifts of God for the people of God.
of Christ and the cup of salvation. I was talking with some of the younger people here over dinner about communion. And I asked what they knew about it. And I was told that the bread is his skin and the juice is his blood. And that works. Just like the bread and the juice will enter our stomachs and through our circulatory system go out into us and become part of who we are. We are what we eat, they say. Just like that, Jesus wants to come into us, to live in us, and become part of all that we are and do. And that's when life is really good. Please join me in the prayer after communion. This one is responsive. Loving Lord, you sent your Son into the world not to condemn it, but to save it. We pray for your church here and throughout the world, for its people who love and serve others, and for all who suffer for the sake of Christ. Strengthen them that they may grow in your grace and give them the peace of Christ. Strengthen us in you so that we might live together in unity with one another and with you. We pray for the nations of the earth and their leaders, for all who work to end conflict and war, for our own country, its president, legislators, judges, and for men and women in military service. Rule in the hearts and minds of those in authority at home and abroad, so that they may be subject to your justice. Lead us into your peace, Lord. We pray for all who suffer in body or in mind, for victims of violence, for those who have lost loved ones, for those in despair, for the sick, the dying, and for all who care for them. Sustain them. Help them to perceive your presence and to receive your healing power or to enter the place prepared for them by Jesus in your eternal home. We pray for the world, for ourselves, and for those whose faith is weak or wavering. We pray, meet us where we are. Strengthen our faith. Help us to perceive more of your loving presence. Tenderly transform us increasingly into the likeness of Jesus and empower us to labor with him in his ongoing ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. As the things are removed from the sanctuary, we invite you to join in singing, Jesus, remember me. After everything is removed, we'll depart singing this song. It's a beautiful juxtaposition between 
Maundy Thursday and Easter Sunday, we leave singing Jesus Remember Me and we return singing Hallelujahs. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. 